morning, fellow humanists. It's an honor to be with you on this Sunday morning. Fall is here. We've got an overcast day in Portland, but still beautiful out there. And we've had a dynamic green room before our program. Uh, we were testing our memory on certain things. A lot of humor, a lot of laughter in the green room. And we have a dynamic presenter this morning. You're really going to enjoy this program. And I am thrilled to be the facilitator of it this morning. A reminder that humanism is a rational philosophy informed by science, inspired by art, and motivated by compassion. It advocates the extension of participatory democracy and the expansion of an open society standing for human rights and social justice. Last week, Anne Henderson joined us at the Friendly House in three-dimensional form for a spectacular reading. And this week, she joined us in two-dimensional form via Zoom for a reading that will be equally as compelling. Please welcome Anne Henderson. Yay. OK. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I was going to read last week um, a, a speech by Julia Sweeney and then saw the Judy Dench thing and, and did that instead. But anyway, I've, I've got a uh, three, about two minutes of Julie, uh, Julia Sweeney's speech at the Reason Rally in 2016, just before Trump became president. So anyway, um, it's about uh, separation of church and state. You may say the new lovable Pope Francis is leading the Catholic Church towards sanity. Not exactly, at least not when it comes to women and re reproductive control. When the Zika virus, uh, with the Zika virus spreading and many people urging the Pope to relax his views on contraception, he said that abortion was absolutely evil and that contraception is slightly less evil. Then he offhandedly referred to a special dispensation argued for by uh, John Paul in the 1960s, where he claimed it was permissible for nuns in the Congo to use birth control pills because they were being raped so often by the local militias that they were becoming pregnant and unable to continue their work. Uh, just let that sink in for a moment. That's the only case where the church or Pope Francis can possibly imagine where contraception could be ethical. He seemed to half-heartedly and even blithely imply that might that might also be the case for women trapped in the Zika virus tragedy. My mind boggles over that one. But then the Pope did nothing to clarify, let alone codify these sentiments. In the meantime, millions of poor women in South America who are Catholic, where abortion is illegal, mostly because of the Catholic Church, are at risk for bearing Zika babies that will, among other things, surely keep them and their children condemned to poverty. Not only that, the Zika virus is making its way here, and our own government is making birth control choices for women more and more limited. This is because of the religious right, including the Catholic Church. Many of my Catholic friends let, let, tell me privately that they are non-believers, atheists, but they're still going to church for cultural and sentimental reasons. I get that. I really do. Some are even part of great groups like Catholics for Choice, but most are silent. Because of this, they allow themselves to be counted among the number that the conservative Catholic organizations say they represent. I think conservative religious influence does not represent the American public. I think there are a lot of people out there, formerly part of one religion or another, and by their silence, they lend themselves to a very insidious political pressure towards fundamentalism, patriarchal, patriarchy, and superstitious laws. As Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. This needs to change. We are here today just by showing up at this rally, are counting ourselves among those without gods or masters, but as free thinking individuals, free from superstition and supernaturalism. Let our voices be heard. We are the nuns and our voices are loud and clear. We want a separation between the church and state, just as our forebearers envisioned. Let's succeed at this great American experiment. 
Thank you, Anne, for a timely and thought-provoking reading. This morning's presentation is by Shukuru Roshunika about the role of epigenetics in skin, skin cancer. Shukuru is currently working at the Anschutz Medical Campus in the Dennis Root Laboratory in Colorado. This lab's, me, in, this lab's impactful work spans stem cells, cancer research, and cell biology, driving his commitment to scientific exploration and advancement. Shakuru's accomplishments range from being a Princeton Mole Bioscholar, a Harvard BSCP student, and a Ford Fellowship Honorable Mention, as well as a McNair Scholar. Let's have a rousing ovation from our friendly house audience and a warm yet muted welcome for Shakuro Rushanika. Hey, hey Todd, uh, thank you for, for the great introduction. Um, I, I will add that uh, at the moment I am transitioning to a different lab. So I'm not currently with the uh, Roop Laboratory, but I'll be happy to um, still present this and, and, and share some of the stuff I did while I was there. Okay, and I also forgot to mention for our, our audience that this will be very interactive and between slides, there will be time for a couple of questions because the total uh, dialogue of the slide presentation is about 15 minutes. So we have time for questions in between slides whenever anyone wants to enter their name in the chat. So uh, hello, everyone. Um, like Todd introduced me, my name is Shakuru Shanika, and I'm going to be presenting the subject epigenetics impacts of 5-AZA2 deoxycytidine on cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. So we'll start with some background where I define epigenetics and epigenetic genetics and cancer, and then cutaneous cell carcinoma, as well as re the research experiment, and then future directions for that research experiment. So the official definition um, for, the, for epigenetics is pretty long, but it's the changes in the, in the chromatin which permit different patterns of gene expression from the same nucleotide sequence of the genome. Um, epigenetic changes do not alter the nucleotide sequence, yet the alterations may be transmitted through mitosis and meiosis. So I have a I have a pretty general term just to help us understand um, understand what I'll be talking about. But the general definition is just looking at the changes in gene expression, which are not a result of of the changes in DNA base uh, base pairs. So typically, um, let me see if I can get a little flash um, laser pen. So so typically when people are talking about um, genetics, they're, they're talking they're typically talking about these um, they're referring to the act changes in these nucleotides where you've got um, base pair bonding here and then you've got you know your adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine um, DNA base pairs. But today, let me go ahead and move this real quick. But today I want to get into um, looking at um, accessibility to these chromosomes. So the first, um, let's, we first need to understand how DNA packaging works. So the most basic unit is the nucleosome, is a nucleosome which is, um, which is, um, which consists of DNA wrapped around the proteins known as histones, right there. And then the next, the next step of that is the is that these nucleosomes are then connected like beads on a string to form what is known as a, as a chromatin. And I am skipping, so this is the chromatin fiber here, and I am skipping a, a step known as the 30, nanomo, 30 nanometer step, which is um, 30 nanometer step folding and coiling, but all these eventually lead to the chromosome structure that is very familiar right here. So why is this important? Um, it's important because this packaging directly impacts gene expression, which is what we are interested in in this project. So two fundamentals, um, to, in order for a cell to become cancerous, it, it's well known that um, two fundamentals have to occur. Process known as carcin carcinogenesis. And those two fundamentals are activation of oncogenes and deactivation of tumor suppressor genes. So let's go ahead and quickly define what these, what a tumor suppressor gene and what an oncogene is. So an oncogene are genes, they're genes that are involved in regulating cell growth, division, and differentiation. 
uh, because of this, when the gene is altered, it can lead to uncontrolled and abnormal cell growth. Um, and then the tumor suppressor genes that they're genes that encode for proteins whose whose role is to inhibit the formation of tumors, keeping abnormal cells in check. And then I've got this um, analogy of of the of the gas and the brake. So it, it, for me, a, a car is is dangerous to itself and others when the brake is not working. So all things being equal, tumor suppressor genes becoming ineffective um, leads to a more potent cancer. And then we want to look at um, epigenetics as it relates to, to cancer. The most studied epigenetic um, modification is, is, DNA, is DNA methylation, where certain regions of DNA become hypermethylated and condensed. This results in an inaccessible region in, in relation to cancer these regions of hypermethylation are at the tumor suppressor gene region. And this tight condensed structure is known as the heterochromatin structure. Another epigenetic modification that is, is well known is DNA acetylation, where acetyl groups are added to the prom promoter region of a gene, resulting in an open and more accessible DNA region, allowing for an increase in transcription and overexpression of, of the gene. This is another method of activation of the mentioned oncogenes. As, and then methylation is a, is a method of, of suppression for these, of, or deactivation of these tumor suppressor genes that I mentioned. And Shakur, you kind of explained this, I think. I'll jump in with a question. Yes. Can you, can you explain hypermethylation, hypermethylation again? So hypermethylation is just it, it's increase of of these methyl groups in in these regions of uh, where typically it's typically on tumor suppressor gene regions and like I said those tumor suppressor genes are encode for proteins that are known to inhibit the inhibit the um, formation of of tumors so typically a a characteristic of a cancer cell. It, it, as it becomes cancerous, it starts to actually turn, uh, methylate those regions that have uh, th those regions with the tumor suppressor um, genes. And, and, it, and this typically is just a, a natural selection process that tends to behoove the, um, the cancer cell itself. Okay, thank you. And it looks like we also have a question on Zoom from Joyce. Okay. So if I'm understanding this correctly, if the, uh, is it pronounced oncogene? Oncogenes, yes. If the oncogenes are not controlled by the tumor suppressor, let me see if I can get this clear. Mm -hmm. They go crazy and they are, are affected by the environment or that's, that's how the cancer gets a chance to get started and spread? So it needs to, in order for a, a, a cell to become cancerous, two fundamental things have to happen, which is just one, the oncogene, I, I think of it as the gas. These, um, these oncogenes are known to control the tumor, the cell growth and proliferation. And so naturally, when these are mutated, they then allow the cell to grow uncontrollably. But then typically, if, if that is the only thing that, that occurs, the cell is typically able to still, um, st still get um, naturally selected out through via the tumor suppressor genes. If those genes are still activated, it will it will. When these on oncogenes are activated, typically the tumor suppressor genes also activated, and it results in the, in the cell not becoming cancerous. But for it to become cancerous, it needs both of these to also occur, where the oncogene is turned off or or activated and then the tumor suppressor gene is turned off. And what makes it get turned off? Um, what makes the tumor suppressor gene turned off? Typically, in this case, we're looking at, um, as, as, at a process known, known as methylation, where the, the access to, the, to this gene region, where the, um, the access to the region of that tumor suppressor gene is typically it's it's typically it becomes inac inaccessible whenever look when you look at this slide that I'm pointing at right here, mm -hmm. adding methyl groups to this to this 
chromosome structure, it results in this condensed structure that results in a um, in inaccessibility to that region. And typically that region is at that tumor suppressor region. And, and yeah, mm -hmm. this is one way that um, these tumor suppressor genes are turned off. But there are multiple ways. But in this case, we're just focusing on the on this way of methylation, where it just the access to that is, is cut off just because of the structure of the um, the DNA itself or the chromosome itself is is tightened. Hmm. And another question, just defining a term, our Hank Rob asks, what does acetylation do again? So acetylation is it's a sort of like the opposite of methylation, where you're you're actually opening up the chromatin structure, and in this way you're making. The idea is that with this structure being being accessible now, is that that increase that increases overexpression of the genes that are in that area. So it's it's like the one opposite of each other. Methylation condenses it, and acetylation opens it. Okay, that that's helpful. Thank you. And we have another question from Dave Gray. Although I'm thinking you be the judge of this, Shikuro. I'm thinking this might be better uh, toward the uh, conclusion of the presentation. But Dave Gray asks, "What is the consensus among oncologists about the Warburg effect and telling patients to eat minimal sugars?" Um. So, uh, yeah, you're right. It's probably going to be better to talk about that after because I, I it doesn't relate as much to this, um, but I, and and the knowledge that I have in the Warburg effect is is pretty limited as well. So, okay, yeah. sounds great. Uh, I think that's all the questions for now. Uh, you're doing great. Keep keep going. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we're going to go ahead and look at. Um, we're also going to look into squamous cell carcinoma as well. Um, so squamous cell carcinoma over here is one of three types of three cell types in the top layer of the skin known as the epidermis. They are, they are flat cells at the surface that are known to shed continuously as new ones are formed. So the way that um, squamous carcinoma is, presents is typically like a firm, red, scalpy bump, um, sometimes open sores rough, thickened, or wart-like skin. And it's typically diagnosed via a skin biopsy and then an examination under the microscope, treated through radiation, chemotherapy, and or surgical excision. Okay. In order to actually get into, let's go ahead and get into our, the research now. Um, in conducting this research, we, we utilized mice that had been expressed in squamous cell carcinoma. Um, we then cultured the cells in a Petri dish in a petri dish, and once they were considered healthy to experiment on, we began ad administering the AZA drug or AZA treatment, which is the 5-AZA-2 deoxycytidine, by pipetting it into the petri dish and and just allowing the cells and changing out the the media over time. Real quickly, let's go let's go over the the mechanism of of AZA. So the way that AZA works is that once it enters the cell, um, AZA is incorporated, it's incorporated into DNA, forming an irreversible um, co covalent bond with a protein known as DNA methyltransferase. This covalently trapped DNA, DNMTs are eventually degraded, which are required for methylation. So it relates back to methylation as I introduced to you. Um, the concept behind this is that this demethylation drug it, it, it can, it can reactivate or make the tumor suppressor genes accessible again. This, thus, because cancer cells are dependent on the silencing of these tumor suppressor, suppressors, they therefore are inhibited from growing while normal cells are not impacted. Okay, let's take a call from the, or a question from the friendly house. Or... Uh... Dave, do you have one at the Friendly House, or is this Helen on Zoom with the question? Yes, um, thank you. Um, so how are you able to limit the 5-AZA-2 um, prime deoxycytidine? Mm -hmm. How are you able to limit that to um, removing the methylation on 
uh, around the tumor suppression gene, but not affect other parts of the DNA? Let me think about it for a second. Um, let me let me make sure I understand your question. So just you're essentially asking how is DNMT selective, right? Of only. Um... Yes. So um, you're removing the methylation on the um, in the area of the tumor suppression gene to allow it to be more active. But how are you able to just target it to the uh, methylation around the tumor suppression gene and not affect methylation in the rest of the DNA. Yeah, so that's actually one of one of the issues in this drug is that it, it looks like it's more of a general. Um, it generally works on on the the global methylation instead of just specific. So the idea is is sort of that with these cancer cells becoming being more dependent on uh, me methylation on silencing these tumor suppressor genes the, the idea is just that it would it, it would impact those more but I, I don't think it's selective on on only tumor suppressor genes so it could it could also demethylate other areas as, as well and i know that is an issue of this drug it is fda approved as well but there's still um, there's still ongoing research on that on how to may maybe make it more specific. We also have a question from Helen from our Zoom audience. Okay. Hi. Now, help me understand that where this squamous cell cancer begins, is it the, I, there's a very rich basal layer at the, of the epidermis, mm -hmm. at the base of the epidermis that has a rich blood supply and um, is alive, but then as the as those basal cells move away, they we just shed them. They they die. So where does the does where does the cancer begin in this squamous cell? Is it is it the base of the epidermis or where does it start? Um, I'm I'm not really sure, but it looks like it, it's more the the epidermis. So would be because that there's this there's this my constant mitosis 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 of the basal exactly. cell. Exactly. Yeah, they're being we shed clone, all the time. Yes. Yeah, we clone that that layer. We don't we we don't produ we produce it. We, just like we produced from our from our birth. You know, making new cells. It's they're identical. Mm -hmm. So something goes wrong. It's got to go wrong in the basal layer, then, right? Something happens that either it. It, it starts to produce too much of this this cancer cell, and there's nothing to stop that production. Is is that correct? So I would like to think that it it, it would have to be in the basal area for yeah. it to for them to be to be able to stay around, right? Because yeah. with with them being shut shut off all the time, then it wouldn't wouldn't be an issue. But yeah. it, I suppose it would have to be in that basal region. Basal region, yeah. yes. That's yeah, that's fascinating. So it is a cancer of the epidermis. Squamous yes. cell then would be a cancer of the epidermis. So yes. thank you. So it's mm -hmm. it's a setup. If you can turn it off and turn it on, you get the cells to turn it off and the others to turn it on, and then you get this mass production, you know, um, and it, it just makes sense. Thank you. So first in beginning the experiment, uh we, we first wanted to investigate AZA's ability to inhibit proliferation? And if so, um, is this concentration dependent? And proliferation is just essentially just the, the cell's ability to grow and divide over time. Mm -hmm. um, and in the following slide, we let the cells grow in, in the Petri dish for several days with a change of media solution and new drug every 24 hours. Um, we found that AZA does in fact inhibit cell proliferation in a concentration dependent manner. Um, in this experiment, we had the same cell line with different mutations. With different mutations, one was an oncogenic mutation of of KRAS, and the other was a a KRAS mutation plus that tumor suppressor P53 mutation. So here, this is an oncogenic mutation. This is both the oncogenic and the um, the tumor suppressor mutation. Um, 
So it makes sense that on average, the cells with the tumor suppressor and oncogene mutations proliferated faster or um, were more resistant to our AZA treatment. All right, so this experiment here could be considered more like a quality control to check if our results were, are, are consistent. Um, in this experiment, we, we treated and replated the cells every other day. So we gave them one day of rest to adhere to the dish after treatment and trypsonization, which is just lifting them off the dish. We also found that there was indeed inhibition by AZA in relation to cell proliferation. Although it, in, in the higher concentrations of five micromolars and 10 micromolar, there was not much deviation. We, all, we wanted to know, um, we wanted to know if this inhibition also occurs in vivo or within the organism. So at this point, we've, we are at, at that point where we've, tre we've injected the tumors into the mice and they've grown and now we've harvested them, sectioned them into slides, and now we are staining them for certain markers in, in that tissue. So uh, in, in assessing the difference, we used an antibody that reacts with a marker known as ki 67 which is a clinical marker that gives insight into the aggressiveness or growth potential of a, of a tumor. So the more a KS67 expressed, the more aggressive a tumor is considered. Um, so we found that the control group not only had a higher percentage of KS67 expressing cells, but also had a higher overall intensity. Um, in, in conclusion, we, so we have reason to believe that AZA also inhibits proliferation within the organism or leads to a less aggressive cancer cell. And I, I'm just realizing that I, I also need to explain what you're seeing here in the images. Um, so just to briefly explain what you're seeing here, each, each, so this is a section of tissue from the, from this is the control group tissue. And what you're seeing here is each dot, and it's not very, very clear, but each dot is, is essentially a cell on that, on that tissue. And what we do is we, we stain it with CAS67, which is the marker that I mentioned, that clinical marker that's known for um, to be expressed on, on cells that are actively, actively proliferating or actively, actively dividing. And then what we do is we use this other um, dye known as DAPI that, is no, that will um, stain the nuclei of the cell. So, it's, so we're able to confirm that what we're seeing is indeed a cell. And then on, on this end over here, we're able to look at the percentage of how many cells have we, conf how many of those cells confirmed uh, also express KS67. And then we're able to get a percentage of that and look at the difference between the, the control group and the AZA treated group. And that, that's where I mentioned that, you know, there's a, about 19% of the cells, of the cells that were confirmed as cells also express um, KS67 with only 10% in, in the AZA group. While I also looked at the intensity uh, of KS67 as well to see if, that, if there was a difference. And there was a, there was a difference, although it wasn't as significant as, as it was up, up, up here. Um, I think I'm with you on this part about the markers and figuring out um, how much, how effective the AZA has been but I was lost way back before. You're ahead of me on what AZA is and hmm. how it works. Okay. So, yeah, uh, let me go back a little bit. Um, I, I didn't dive into too much detail over here, but AZA is a a methylation drug, is what it's it's what it, it's um, known as, where it it essentially. Um, when it's incorporated into the cell, it forms a bond with these, um, with this protein known as DNA methyltransferase, which is in, which is known as the, which is important in in in, um, in the process of methylating um, the 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 gene regions that I mentioned earlier, those tumor suppressor regions. And what it does is once it forms this, once AZA forms this covalent bond with DNMT. It leads DNMT into into degradation. So with DNMT being gone, it it essentially allows for it essentially like inhibits methylation over over um, those those gene regions that I mentioned earlier. 
Is that where epigenetics come in because you've introduced a foreign substance? I think so. The epigenetic part of it is the fact that we are looking at the accessibility of the rather than looking at the DNA base changes themselves, uh, because typically like in genetics, you're, you're, you're talking about um, the actual changes in the bases where, you, you know, in the DNA base themselves. But in this case, we're just simply talking about the access to those gene regions. So it's like on a higher, on a higher level where, let me go back to the slide where typically, so this, the changes in these base pairs here, is genetics typically, but in this case, we're talking about just the access to that higher level um, region of just the access to those DNA base pairs is is affected, and that that is where epigenetics comes in. Did I answer your question, Joyce? I think so. Thank you. If not, we can always chat about it after too. <laughs> yeah. We need to work on my brain. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. Oh, no. <laughs> so going forward now, um, now we'll start seeing some more representative images of, of those mice tumors. Uh, we simply wanted to measure in, the, in, this, in this experiment the average tumor volume over time. This was just measuring height and width. Uh, we began noticing a difference with AZA treatment around the two-day two -day mark. Thus, we treated the cells for, for about two days with AZA before injecting them. Notice a decrease in tumor volume over time in the AZA treated groups. So here's the, these are the AZA treated groups with the, and then the control. And, and what we can conclude here is that AZA seems to decrease tumor, tumor aggressiveness. There's the controlled tumor and there's the AZA tumor, very, very small, but you know, there's a significant difference. And this was on about six, six mice. We were also interested in the size of the tumors. When, when harvesting the tumors, we weighed them and found that on average, the AZA treated groups weighed significantly less. We even tried, a two, di we even tried two different concentrations, but ended up with similar results. So this is the 0.5 micromolar group treated groups where we treated the cells for two days at that 0.5 micromolar concentration and then injected them into the, into the mice to see if there was a difference. And then we harvested them and, and weighed them. Then this is for the one micromolar and there's an even more significant difference or somewhat similar. And then I also wanna note that these are preliminary findings. So, you know, they're, they're still subject to, subject to change and different findings. We have a hand up in our Zoom audience from Hank Rob. Okay, so um, I wanna try an analogy and, and you tell me if this analogy works at all. It's, uh, uh, it, it's a little anthropomorphic, but stick with me if you can. The DNA is like a gigantic library. Um, methylation says, you can't read these books. Acetylation says, you really have to read these books right now. And the reason, and, and, and those two things are what epigenetics is about. What books can be read and what books can't be read. Yes, it's one of the ways. that There are multiple ways, but those are the two most studied ways. And it seems like... Um, the, the ways that tend to, the other ways are, are not always present, but these seems to be more, more present in cancer cells. Yes. I, analogy is spot on. That's a good one. I might have to borrow that. To, if I stick with my analogy, in cancer cells, uh, you are not allowed or you have low access to books about suppressing uh, cancer, mm -hmm. and you have high access to books about making uh, cells. Or, and, yes, or, and so or what regions we, that um, can lead or 
region of, of genes that can lead to um, to the activation of these cells um, with uncontrollably. Yes. And so what the what the AZA is doing is is uh, <laughs> as it were uh, making the librarian give you access to books that you didn't have before namely books on how to suppress cancer. Yes, I I agree with that analogy. Thank That's you. humanism at its best right there, bringing science and literature together. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that was good, yeah. We have one other question from Dave Gray. I'll go ahead and read it from the Zoom audience. He writes, I'm not clear where you get the AZA. Is it chemically produced or what? Yes, um, essentially, yeah, I actually don't even... So we we just order it from from a, a pharmaceutical company that manufactures it, but uh, yeah, they essentially chemically produce it. And we also have a question from Dell. Yes. Now, in when this uh, tumor decreases in size, is it uh, a loss of uh, liquid, or is it a loss of uh, material or tissue? What, what's happening here? Where, where, what, why is it decreasing in size? Um, it, so it seems like it, it, it's sort of one. In the, it, it's one in the in the same. That is, uh, you know, as the tissue, the tissue size decreases, it probably needs less less um, liquid, as you mentioned. Um, but we that's the that's actually the direction that we're trying to go now. Is that okay? We see that there is a decrease for sure. That the drug is having an an impact. Um, but the direction, and this is going to get into the future directions here, and it'll be the next slide. So I'll, I'll move into that real quick. Um, but the future direction is now that we've, we, we've, you know, looked at everything earlier and we see that the drug is having an effect. We also want to check, okay, as I mentioned earlier, if this DNMT, if this AZA drug is indeed affecting is, or is known to affect the DNA methyltransferases, we wanted to look at DNA methyltransferase abundance. So the idea behind that is that as, so in the group with the AZA treated compound, we should see less DNMT abundance in protein. And with the control groups, we should see an increase or a higher level of DNMT as opposed to AZA group. So that's a future direction that we're trying to uh, that the lab is, is going to go. And then the other aspect of this, we also want to know, could it be that the immune system is also having an impact in this? Could this, could these results that we're seeing there, could it be that AZA is somehow uh, finding a way to introduce that um, um, cancer cell to the immune system or to make the immune system more competent? Um, so that's a future direction as well. And then the other one is looking at um, this, um, looking at the histones themselves that I mentioned earlier to see whether or not those histones are in a, a, a structure of hetero, that um, tight condensed structure that I mentioned, or are they in more of a, of a looser structure uh, th that's the U -U 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 chromatin structure? Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, and if you have any more questions, please ask. I realize that I, I didn't take up as much time as I... Uh, as you guys gave me, but um, I was hoping for, I was hoping that um, that at least allowed us to be more interactive. Well, thank, you. thank you, Shakuro. You took a very detailed subject and you made it uh, very understandable and exciting for us. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I'll start out with the two questions and I know more will be coming in uh, on the chat of Zoom as well as within the Friendly House. Um, Helen okay. has both my parents died of cancer. So anytime cancer is discussed, it's a very personal topic for me. And I'm always curious to know, like, how, how is it decided that uh, AZA is a good treatment for skin cancer, uh, but maybe not effective for other cancers? Or does it have applications for other cancers? Yeah. So that's typically like a, the question you're asking involves more like higher level physiology. And, and that's, you know, understanding the human body. I know, for example, like right now, AZA is, tends to be toxic um, to, to the, um, 
um, what is it the um what produces urine oh, real quick i'm forgetting the name or oh, what uh, filters through urine i know someone in our audience will have that answer it's not kidney. me the kidney the kidney, the, the kidney. okay Yes, it's toxic to the kidney. So, you know, the question you're asking involves more like a higher level of physiology. But in this case, we, we're just looking at, you know, it starts, it starts at the bottom where you're looking at the cell first, you know, does it do anything on the cellular level? And then once we get into more, you know, um, the, the human side of things, we have to consider, you know, what other impacts it might have on like organ, on organelles and, and whatnot. So I don't know if it's, if it's practical yet, but that's a direction I think people are hoping to, to take it. And before I get to my second question, we have a couple questions from our Zoom audience. Another question from Helen. Hi, could you go back to the, the slide where it shows the, the tumors and then the, the AZT mm -hmm. is, let, is like a lower and then the other one, the, the, the other one yes. goes way up. Yes, I'll do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my understanding and, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, is you transplant these tumor cells onto the mice. Mm -hmm. One gets, doesn't get the AZA and the other one does. And the, the, the way they get the AZA is through an injection. Yes. So yes. let me go back real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens is we treat, the, we treat the cells here for about two days with the AZA drug. So in, in, but we have two different groups, one treated cells treated with AZA and one treated, one not treated with AZA, uh, which one treated with a control substance that's just as a, that acts as a, as a control for us. Um, and then we inject those tumors, uh, um, those cells, uh, as you saw here, right. where we, the one, the cells that were not treated with AZA, they, they get injected on top of the mouse. And then the ones that, that were injected with AZA get injected at the bottom of the mouse just to, because what, what we wanted to make sure was that um, different mices, um, we, we didn't have a um, confounding factor of having different, injecting only one, right. w one mouse with one group. We wanted right. to have both groups in one mouse so that way we can see that's if the good, results are consistent. Yeah, that's a good study. Now, at that point, is there any more AZA um, play given to the mouse. No, it's just a one time, and we 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 just in, inject them once, and then we just let the mice um, they grow go on and see if the t when when the, the tumor shows up. So I think um, Dell's question about what is that? What is it? Is that um, is it water? Is it cell tissue? It's the fact that the tumor didn't grow. It wasn't that the tumor decreased. It yeah, was, it just didn't grow. Yes, it was on grow. average they had a decreased volume, right? Overall volume, like where right. we measured the height and the width, and that yeah, some of them just some of them didn't grow at all. They're, but right. in this case, I think you can you can somewhat measure that one. Yes, but there's a little average. Bit. Yeah, they were mm -hmm. smaller. Yeah, and then in the tumor that you're seeing, the large tumor, the control, mm -hmm. that's cancer cell. What you're seeing is cancer cells. Yes, yes, that's that's cancer cell. Those are yes. those are the yes. injected tumor cells. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so um, one of the nice things about skin is that you can have, you know, you can observe it and you can place it where other and, and the the squam the epidermis is is the only cell in the body that goes through mitosis. Everything else is if you hurt it, it has to be repaired. Like if you get um, even if you get a deep cut, it's replaced by scar. But the epidermis, that top layer, is through mitosis. So it's a great way to study what a cell does because you're it, you're actually it's it's reproducing, reproducing, reproducing. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, you wouldn't be able to. It's it's a it's a different any other kind of cancer deeper in the body. You, you would be a, a different way that the cancer um, begins, a different kind of cell. Every other cell is different than the epidermis, but um, in many ways, not, you know, that it's, it, it just has to repair itself, uh, repl you know, replace. So it would be harder to get to, too. But th mm -hmm. this is a really fascinating study in that you were able to compare it right there on the animal, you know. Yes. I, I, 
I worked at a burn center for so many years and there was no way to, you can't, to have a control in a, as far as burn, burn, the success of a burn treat, you just had to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I really congratulate you on, on uh, the way that this study was conducted. It's a, um, and your research there shows it worked. I mean, that's, that's, that's great results. Absolutely wonderful results. I have a wonderful team, wonderful mentors. So I, I couldn't take all the credit at all. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, your team, science is done by teams. Yeah, exactly. not, nobody's doing it uh, in a garage, yeah, but exactly. uh, by themselves. But uh, I, I just find that fascinating. I really do that uh, you were able to compare the two and show that show that they worked. It's a great start. I mean, it's a really great start of, of, of um, cancer control as a cellular level. And that's what we're going to have to find. I mean, that's the key. Mm-hmm. That is the key. Mm-hmm. Not, you know, um, right now we just can do surgery. I mean, that's the only, I mean, basically, um, we're on the cusp of something new with the cellular level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How'd you get into this? I mean, yeah. that that's a, you know, how did you get, get that into this? So initially, like, I wasn't even gonna, gonna go to college initially, actually, but um, I started, I figured out, I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go and, and, and see what it's all about. And I bumped into one of my mentors, um, James Hoy, and he's not here today, but he, um, when, when I was hanging out with him, I just, I spent some time at the cancer rehab center that we have here at the University of Northern Colorado. And that's just really how I got into it. From, from then on, I just, you know, I, I kept playing around with it and I eventually got a job at Anschutz and, you know, I, I, she just presented this project and I was like, okay, I'll take it on. And, you know, it's well turned done. out well. Yeah. And it's nice when you get good results like that. It's always yes. like, oh. yes, yes, yes. There's a lot of frustration behind all those results though. Yeah. I, will, I will admit. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's clean, but it's clean. It looks pretty clean now. Thank you. And Shikuru, Helen's our second MC. And you can tell from that by her jumping in with those fine questions and uh, yes. leading us here in Q and A yes. today. Uh, yes. I have a yes. question that I'll read from Ellen Silverman. Uh, she asks, uh, how was AZA discovered? Um, you know, uh, I, I'd like to think it's a serendipitous discovery uh, like they typically are, but I'm I'm not particularly like sure. Um, I, I just remember reading about it, but those subjects didn't really talk about how they discovered it. It's just, you know, what I could do is, is I can find out real quickly too, actually. Well, I just wonder, like sometimes, do they just try different chemicals and throw them on cells and see what works and what doesn't? I mean, I, I'm I telling you, that's just like, yeah, I just, yeah. Just... Yeah. I know a lot of pharmaceutical companies will just have like um, a, a whole library of just different chemicals that are known, you know, that yeah. are collected and they'll just. Documentation yeah, from, helps yes. a lot. Yeah. Gotcha. Yes, from the beginning, they, they kind of have to, there's no other way. Yeah, sometimes from our presenters, uh, if they want to get back to us with with further research or an answer to a question, we're happy to read that to our audience in a future week. So uh, okay. we look forward to uh, keeping in touch with you. But we have more questions. Looks okay. like we have some repeat questioners. So I hope I, I get this in the correct order. Uh, Dell from the Friendly House has another question. So so what does what does Epi have to do with this? What's happening that that uh, based on epigenetics, I, I don't, I didn't understand anything that you related to epigenetics here. Can mm-hmm. you can you refresh my me- that little yes. bit? Yes, of course. So, so typically, ep- epigenetics is is defined as looking at, and this is a pretty general term for it, but it's looking at the changes in gene expression mm-hmm. that are, are a result of just the access to the gene itself. So um, typically when whenever people are talking about, you know, genetic changes or gene mutations, they're talking about actual changes in this, in, you know, in this zoomed in area right here, they're, we're, they're talking about actual changes in these where like they'll have, um, they'll have like exam, for example, like a, a deleted, deleted gene, um, deleted base pair in there, where it's just completely gone, and there, and that might lead to a mutation, and that's that's typically what g- geneticists will look into. But in epigenetics, we're looking at the accessibility or the of this entire region, 
so it's like on the higher level um, scale where you've got, um, I, I forget the name of who gave the analogy, but it's more looking at, you know, you just, you simply can't get access to the regions that you need to get access to, but those regions are still there. So that's what epigenetics is. It's looking at, if you were to, um, let me go back here, where in, in methylation, there's this condensed structure. So the genes that are in here, the genes that are in, are, are in here, you, you cannot access them anymore. But that's not to say that the, the DNA in there is compromised. So that the, the integrity of the DNA is still, is still there but you still don't have access to this region at all. And that's where epigen epigenetics comes in, is that it's the accessibility of this region itself isn't there. That's what, um, that's the simple, that's the most fundamental aspect of, meth of epigenetics, is looking at these changes there. And Hank was the one with our library analogy earlier, and he yes. has up with another question. Go ahead, Hank. So, <clears throat> so Dell um, and some others in my life have been trying to help me with the original idea that I had about DNA, which was uh, life expresses itself through its library. Mm -hmm. And different life forms have different libraries. And originally, <laughs> That's the end of that. Uh, but along comes uh, this epigenetics uh, idea and says, yeah, well, you may get a library, but getting access to the books is uh, trickier than you thought. You mm -hmm. don't have access to all the books all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the thing that I would like to try to understand is, um, epigenetics, again, as I understand it, is about which books does life, this particular life form, what books does it have access to? Because it doesn't have access to all the books in its library all the time. And if I understand right, methyltransferase is a chemical or it's a that 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 takes books away so you can't read them or i think that's what it does right it's more it's a, it's, it's a protein um or oh no uh, methyl transferase methyl methylene itself is a is a chemical but um dna methyl transferase itself it has a role it, it's a protein that has a role in so your analogy is right but it's more like the um the the thing that's actively doing it is different but your analogy is spot on yes so how how does if if i if if when a cell recreates itself through mitosis when it does that it's giving the library on again but if i got epigenetics right it also passes along based on the experience of the organism. In this case, the experience is uh, this chemical that's been added. Uh, I forgot the letters, but whatever the chemical was, it it is passing along to the next generation, so to speak. Uh, keep access to these books open right i'm not sure if it's if being passed along but um it's it's more that those cells that have been inhibited by aza now cannot grow and divide so they cannot pass it on is, is or they, they can't but i thought the aza demethyl demethylized I think, uh, I think the meth methylation pattern can be passed along but the idea behind this is that okay it it it, it could be passing it um it could be the change in methylation could be 
passed on to a, to the daughter cell. But overall, though, there's probably going to be a lot less daughter cells in that in that group than there was in the control group. Okay, we'll let uh, Hank ponder that one. And uh, <laughs> Joyce, it looks like you had another question. Am I correct about that? Yes. Uh huh. Um, okay, go ahead. I don't remember exactly what was on your futures slide, but I would like to know what the implications are. Are there any immediate implications for treatment? In other words, can uh, human beings be injected with something similar to AZA, or how does this how is this applicable to actual treatment just today and tomorrow and next week? From the point of when um, when treatments are even discovered to then when they're applied, mm -hmm. but. It, Right now, it doesn't seem practical at the moment to do it, um, just because it, there's always, like, I think his name was, was it Hank? Or mm -hmm. no, I don't think it was Hank, but someone earlier asked a question of specificity. And that that's the issue with, with a lot of treatments is that they're not very specific. Mm -hmm. And so it, it would be, you know, yeah, you might be treating treating the cancer cell, but you, you might also be, you know, doing something to the to the normal cells. You know that's that typical that's typically the issue, but you know that's a that's a direction that I hope to be able to to go in the future as my career goes along. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll go ahead and ask my second question as we wait for other questions from either our live or our Zoom audience. Uh, one of the things I like to ask when we have a detailed subject like this, um, I like to know how to learn more about the subject from two perspectives, maybe from the rudimentary perspective like Hank with the library and then maybe someone with a more scientific background so is there a, a magazine that you could recommend on the sort of simplistic level that we could uh, follow research on this and maybe something that's more technical yeah I'm, I'm trying to think because uh, I, I tend to read a lot of more technical stuff but uh, um, there is a good a good book um um, Robert Weinberg writes a pretty good book on, on on cancer biology, and it's I feel like it's something that a general audience can also understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Robert Weinberg writes a pretty good book on uh, on in the introduction to cancer biology, and he and it, he does mention this a, a lot of the stuff that I talked about, the the epigenetics aspect of it as well. And the more technical, it's just you know literature. If you could, if you Google up the drug AZA a lot of things will come up that are technical so there's plenty of technical stuff out there but it's more finding the things that you know is more for for a general audience and I do feel like that that, that is an important th thing for a scientist to realize is to we need to find better ways of sharing this with other people because it, it, it doesn't matter how you know what I think by, by myself with my little science group but it, it we all need to be able to share in it. Thank you. We we have a question from the Friendly House and Dave Danucci. Uh, yeah, I'm basically um, asking again the same thing Helen asked because I'm not sure I understood the answer to her question about how this treatment was administered. That is, in your diagrams, it almost looks like it was administered in vivo or something outside of the body. And then, but you also talked about it being injected. Was any of this happening outside the body, the treatment with a AZA? And, and then how much of it was occurring inside the body? Yes. So um, one thing that I, I'm going to try to make to, I, I realize the confusion of mine that I, 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 and something that I didn't make clear. So in this slide over here, so in this slide right here, what I, what I should have done is, is found a way where I, I show that one ex one experiment is conducted in, in that we go from from the beginning where we treat the cells and then we inject them into the into the mice mm -hmm. and then we allow the mice to to grow those tumors over time. But another part of the experiment was that we simply first wanted to know if there's a change in if if Asia had a change in just the cells themselves before we even injected them. So there are there. There are two experiments. One we, one, we treated the cells and then injected them and then got them all the way. And then one, we just stopped here at this point. Okay, but and if, we just, we let the cells grow over time for a period of about seven days. 
and and they get treated for 24 hours. So to the answer to your question is yes, there's there was in vivo where we did the organism and there was just the petri dish themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and they were not treated further once they were injected in any case. No, no, they were they were just allowed to go, uh, you know, as 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 their normal life were allow. All right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I had kind of a follow up question to the diagram there. How long was the study on the mice, and is there anything still ongoing with the study, or is that completed? So with the mice, we we let them go for. A, We'd see the, the tumor in about a week. And then um, I think, I'm trying to remember, maybe maybe by the third week, um, we, we, we would put them down. But th this experiment is essentially completed. Um, we might do some verification again, just to, to just to see to see if the results are, are consistent, but they're, they're looking like it. Um, the further the further direction is just looking at what I mentioned earlier, where we're just trying to confirm what this change is, because what we know is that there is a change. We don't necessarily know why that change is happening, although we we have literature to believe that allows us to believe that um, that DNA, that we're inhibiting um, DNMT, although we need we do need to confirm that that's the case. Sounds good. And we have a follow-up question from Dave DiNucci. Yeah, so um, uh, so since you only treated these outside of the body in vivo, um, I'm just wondering how it is, is it generalizable? I mean, so you, you, so this doesn't test how well it might shrink a tumor while it's in the body and treated within the body. Is that correct? Do you have some further, uh, is the next step then to go ahead and try to treat this while it's still in the body? Because I mean, I I don't think it's in, in normal circumstances, one would pull a tumor out of a body and treat it and put it yes. in the body to see how, how well yes. it's working. Yeah, that's also a direction to go to. Like, like I said earlier, um, an issue with AZA is that it's uh, with treating the the mice themselves, you're you're adding another factor to this, and that's I mean that is the natural direction to go uh, as we're trying to go towards like clinical trials, but um, yeah, it, it, with with us treating the AZA directly to the mice, like feeding finding a way to supplement that in their diet, you add another factor to it, and that is um, toxicity. Not only you have to consider toxicity not only on the cells like we were, you know, we didn't have to, con but now we have to consider toxicity on the mice itself, whether on the organism or whether on the like, I mentioned earlier, um, the kidney for example, it seems to be AZA seems to be toxic to the kidney, so we would have to find a way to get around that as well, but yes, that that's a that, that's a good natural direction to, to take this study. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, let's take a question, a final question from the Friendly House. Okay. Well, it's from Paul Haggard online, and he okay. said, uh, what is the typical treatment of basal cell carcinoma uh, before this treatment or in in addition? Um, I actually, I'm not familiar with the, the treatment for it, actually, with basal cell carcinoma, but I, I, I'm cutaneous cell carcinoma. It, I, I'm going to assume that it, with basal, it's going to be very similar to where it's just like chemotherapy and, um, and um, you know, what was it? Hank, did you have a question? I see you have a hand up. Yes. Um, so if I understand the way methyl transferase works, it takes methyl, a, a methyl group from adenine and moves it over to cysteine and when it does that, that has the effect of suppressing access to whatever is associated with that uh, particular cysteine part of the book, so to speak. So whenever we're talking about 
doing something that inhibits methyltransferase, we're talking about inhibiting a factor that creates an inhibition. So it's like two negatives make a positive, so to speak. Yes. Is that correct? Sort of, yes. yes. All right, thank you very much. Securo, I think when you take this research on the road, you got to take Hank with you for the general public. <laughs> you, you do the presentation, Hank will do the presentation at the bar afterwards. <laughs> did a wonderful job, so. I'll Definitely at the bar afterwards. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sekiro, not only for your presentation today, for but for your excellent work. Thank you. Thank you. I Great appreciate job. it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. It means a lot to me. Thank you.